will be recorded. This meeting, the re this recording may be broadcast on the authorities' internet. All attendees will be in view of the camera. By attending, you're consenting to being filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings being used as outlined above. Um, okay, so uh, if we start with um, apologies for absence. Um, yes, Chair, we've received apologies from Councillor Julian Amos and from Mr Jeff Beard, Claire Payne and Sammy Farida, co-opted members. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, declarations of interest. Members are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal prejudicial interest in respect of matters contained in this agenda. Um, any declarations of interest? No? Chair, uh, I'd like to declare an interest on agenda item number three, Welsh Public Library Standards Update, um, as I sit on the board of the uh, the Leisure Trust. Okay, um, Maya, if you if we could confirm, I don't think um, I don't think that, that Councillor Salmon would need to um, take any action with that declaration of interest because it is just an update. Would that be right? I think because it's discussed, I, I I am allowed dispensation, but I I did uh, I am just uh, making it uh, making it known that uh, I have that interest. So you, Councillor Salmon, you have actually checked and and you've received dispensation. Yeah, the uh, board members have, have always had uh, dispensation to speak on items regarding the trust. Okay. 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 And, and and likewise for myself, I I work for the trust, um, but. Um, primarily at the, the Red House. Um, I'm nothing to do with the library service. Okay. Okay, okay so, so unless, oh, I've got an echo now. Can everybody hear that echo? Could, Councillor Davis, there we go. Is that that's better? Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm assuming it's safe to move on. Um, next item is item number three, the Welsh Public Library Standards Update. I did ask before the meeting um, whether we could get the pages up on the screen. Maria, are you with us? Are you able to do that? I am, Chair. Let me just see for you now. Uh, sorry, sorry, Chair. I've just had a uh, text message off Jane. I don't know. don't think she's here. Um, somebody's asked if uh, she's asked if somebody can call her into the Teams meeting. Okay, Maya, if you are able to do that. There's my... no one in the lobby, Chair. I'll send another invite now. Okay. Let's just give it a second then to make there we go. So we got the we got the papers up on screen for anybody that needs them. Okay, so if I just do a little introduction for, of the um, of the item be, while we're waiting for Jane. So um, this item, each year the Public Library Services in Wales are required to submit a report to Welsh Government re regarding the performance against standards. Um, if some committee members may remember that we, did, we had the same thing last year, um, or it was either last year or the year before, I remember Jane coming when we were still allowed in the chamber. Um, this report provides the scrutiny committee with the feedback received from Welsh Government and offers details of Welsh Government's judgment in relation to the core entitlements, quality indicators, impact measures and quality indicators and benchmarks. Um, so I, it would be good if we could hand over to Jane for a brief introduction to go over the, the um, some of the main body of the report. Is she here yet? I'm just looking now, I can't see. No, Maya, it's not looking. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Um, Maya, she just asked um, to send it to her personal email address. Um, she'll, have to give me a, she'll have to email me the personal email address then, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 would you, okay. sorry. Like, would you be, yeah, yeah Councillor Davis, if you could sort that out with Jane, Jimmy, via text message. Yeah, and I'll, I'll do is if, if we move on to item number four, we'll come back to Jane. Okay. Jane's here now, Chair. Oh, she is. There we go. Right. So yeah. we're sticking. I'm really sorry. I my IT just seemed to go at the worst time. 
Oh, Jane, you're not the only one. I had a nightmare at the start of the meeting as well. So, uh, welcome. It's nice to see you. It's been a long time. Yes, yes, it has. <laughs> I so, like um, people. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice to see you, and I hope you and your family are really well. Um, just to let you know, Jane, just before you came in, I did a brief introduction of what the agenda item is and what the what, why it's here today. So with that in mind, if you could just go into, we've got the two of the, the main of the, um, sorry, the recommendations are on page five, recommendation 2.1 through to 2.3. So the committee receives the information on feedback received from Welsh Government. 2.2, the committee retrospectively ratifies the report to Welsh Government and 2.3 that the feedback report is accepted and the committee meeting have an opportunity to review and comment on its content. So with that in mind, if I could just hand over to you, Jane, just to do um, give some a sort of brief head, uh, brief overview of the report and some key headlines and then we'll move into questions. Lovely, thank you. Um, yeah, so I've come before scrutiny before, so as many of you do know, each year public libraries are requested and required to submit a report to Welsh Government regarding the performance against the Welsh public library standards. These are the measures by which the Minister who has responsibility for libraries um, can make a decision on the services compliance with the statutory duty, because obviously we're governed by the 1964 Libraries and Museums Act. So this report is really late because the, the year in question for this report is 1920, which takes us to the end of the month of the first lockdown due to the pandemic. So, you know, this, this is the previous year's um, performance. So it, it really is down to the impact of the pandemic that has meant that a report submission and the feedback from Welsh Government has been much delayed to its normal timeframes. So in February of last year, as our report highlighted, we were already beginning to see some of the impacts. And of course, by this date last year, we entered lockdown for the first time. Um, in terms of the library services, we'd already collected almost all of the required information. And it's this that the report is based on. So as per the requirements, we submitted the narrative, the future direction, the report itself and the case studies, which I know that you've had copies of. Um, so a very brief overview of what Welsh Government feedback says after receiving all of that detail. Most Tidville met all 12 core entitlements in full. Of the nine quality indicators which have targets, we met eight in full and one in part. Customer satisfaction levels remained high. Um, if the Tidville is first or second in Wales against most of the measures relating to customer satisfaction. Most Tidville is one of only five authorities in Wales to meet the acquisitions target for stock. And Most Tidville is actually back in the trend of library authorities across Wales and seen borrowing for adults, children and digital services increase. So um, in our mind, that is that is directly attributable to the fact that we continue to invest in stock levels. We continue to spend appropriately on Welsh stock. However, this does show below medium borrowing. Uh, the report does highlight that this could be due to the level of Welsh speaking people in the area um, because we are measured against places like Anglesey, North Wales, where they've got you know much higher percentage of Welsh speakers. Staffing remains below the median, and that's the reason we don't meet all nine quality indicators. Uh, we last met the staffing target in around 2012 before we went to trust, um, and we underwent some efficiency savings. And we saw our staffing levels go from 32 to 17, so that's why we, we just don't meet that target. ICT services are well used, and we've got the second highest usage in Wales for our computer services and only three other library authorities are performing at the same level as Merthyr Tidville and it's got to be said we, we are one of the lowest funded library services in Wales so I think we're doing pretty well. <laughs> the conclusion of Welsh Government was that library services in Merthyr Tidville delivered by Merthyr Tidville Leisure Trust on behalf of the county, on behalf of the County Borough Council. The services performed well throughout the framework 
is only one of five services to meet the acquisitions target. Regular consultation ensures that customer satisfaction levels have remained high. Merthyr is able to anticipate the needs of its community and deliver services needed. And like many other library services in Wales, Merthyr Tidville has seen an increase in most usage figures, including adult and children issues and library membership. Staffing levels have been maintained at 2017-18 levels, but remain below the median in Wales. Despite this, the service notes that it feels it utilises the staff into the best advantage of customers. The service engages with a wide variety of partners to deliver appropriate activities for its communities, and the challenge will be to maintain resource levels in order to continue to deliver that quality service. And that is pretty much the very quick overview of the reports and government feedback. So I'm happy to welcome any questions. Thank you, Jane. OK, so if we could go straight into questions. Uh, OK, let me see. I can't see which hands are up a second. Bear with me. I don't know what's going on today. <sighs> Clive, chair. Clive. I should have known it would be Clive first off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Jones, go ahead. Right, thank you. Um, it's lovely to see you, Jane. Um, I haven't got many questions. First thing foremost, it's a very good detailed report, as always from you. Um, one request, is it possible to put the Tidville back into Merthyr? So it's referred to as Merthyr Tidville and the county before the borough. So it's a, always referred to as the county borough. Um, I just just refer it here as members know i refer it every report with any officer who um doesn't call the name of uh, the, the county but by its proper name um on page 13 under 3.4 and you referred to the staffing levels um i think you said it was uh, 32 at one stage and it's down to 17 uh, so, you know, we got half the staff that we used to uh, run the service and we are still attaining uh, and complying with all the targets that we have there. But in 3.4, uh, it says that the staffing levels have been maintained at 2017-18 levels. Um, and as you reported before, you said the service is still carrying a vacancy for a qualified librarian. Now, um, can you confirm, I was always under the impression that you had to have a minimum of qualified librarians to run the library service. So you, you refer to the fact that um, we comply with everything else and this is the one part. So is there any intention at some stage to advertise for a qualified librarian? Yes, um, the vacancy remained vacant for the, the year that we're talking about um, because of various factors, one of which was a lack of, um, I'm trying to find a nice way of putting it, but there's, there is a lack of talent out there at the moment. Um, library services have suffered over the last few years quite significantly and it's meant that it's it put people off from coming into it as a career um so where when i did my degree there was a, a a glut of librarians we were all over the place you could you know you could shake a stick and you'd find a librarian that's not the case now and i know there are colleagues in other areas as well um bridge end in particular have, have had real issues recruiting um obviously you know we got to the end of that year and, and had things been normal, we would have been looking for possibly not a qualified librarian um, because the, the standard does relate to if you've got a qualification around something that is important in the service. So one of the things we've been looking at is somebody with digital skills as opposed to a, a straight librarianship 
is somebody who has qualifications within that digital field and teaching field because for us that's something else that you know is very very important because even though everybody has a, has a smartphone and everybody seems to be on social media the actual levels of IT literacy um, we find it all the time within libraries the actual levels are quite poor um, so while you can go on social media, you can make a post, actually filling in your census form, applying for your bus pass, doing all of those things require a level of literacy that um, a lot of people just don't have. So we're looking at that sort of angle as opposed to a straight librarian for the times ahead, because these digital services are going to become more and more important. And I think we've all found that over the last year. So to follow that up chair um there are not too many of those animals around in south wales who, who would require not only very good it skills but obviously some sort of qualification in lab librarianship yeah yeah as i say it's we've become very much a niche service at the moment because of the cuts that we faced over the last 10 years um, you know, it, it's it, and it's national. It's not just it's not just in Wales. It's not just local to us. It is a national issue now. Yeah, it's libraries have taken quite a bashing. Yes, throughout the United Kingdom with libraries closing. Thank goodness that's um, not happened um, as such in 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 Merthyr Tydfil. Um, you know, so we we got many uh, places out there where not far away there is a library service whether it's part-time or, or full-time there's a library service um can, can i ask you another because uh, everybody's had a very good difficult year due to, due to the pandemic um have you because obviously um amongst other things apart from people wanting to come in um to look at books there and change their books, etc. And I know you've got this excellent uh, click and collect uh, service, but have you any idea or any anticipation when the library service might be reopening to the public over the next few weeks or few months? Um, obviously, I, I need to con I need do need to speak to our contract managers on from the local authority. But what our pretty much our plan will be is to reintroduce the click and collect because obviously when we went into lockdown that stopped. We are still doing our home deliveries contactless, um, but to restart the click and collect around Easter time, to move to then having appointments for our IT services because that's a massive issue for people. They don't have access to IT, to print in, to photocopy in, all of those things. Um, we are limited by our buildings because they are small. They are difficult to manoeuvre and get people around in a one-way system, but we're working on all of those things at the moment and we hope that by the end of April we will have some semblance of a more normal service Although I think to say that it'll be a normal service is is wrong. It won't be, but it will be becoming more normal, I'm hoping, as long as numbers keep going the right way and that we don't have these massive surges that we've seen most recently in Merthyr. And you, you mentioned the delivery service that you've been undertaking. I mean, that really, in these difficult times, um, you know, it is... Uh, something that needs to be applauded when we go back to some sort of near normality is that something that you would um, continue to do to because you, you you used to do that didn't you in the library service and particularly yeah. for people who are, who are completely um, stuck at home in normal times and, and can't get out yeah um, we've we've run our housebound service for for many many years um, but what we're looking at, I think, for at least the next year is a more blended service. So where people, because I, th I think that people will, will genuinely have fears about coming into public spaces again. And it's going to take 
you know, not everybody, but there will be people who will have those fears about coming into the public, being in, in larger crowds, being with people again. So what we're looking at is having a blended service so that for those people who are nervous, for those people who have been shielding or have had underlying health issues, um, we'll be looking to continue those delivery services alongside trying to push back into a bit more of a normal library service as we always knew it. Thank you, Jane, very much. OK, um, Councillor Bill Smith. Thank you, Chair. Hello, Jane, you're looking well. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Can I say it's an excellent report? But again, with like social services, we'll have an audit report back 18 months, down, six months, nine months down the line. So not a lot we can do with it. Only two questions I got. On the report, you say we're not spending enough money on, on the books that we have in every year. Is that right? No, no. The, right. The, sorry, the report is that we are spending right. to the appropriate levels and are doing quite well. We're one of only five authorities who spend to that, that level. Right, great. I forgot now the other question. I'll come back. Sorry, sorry, Chair. I had to run down, I, got, I lost it. OK, Bill, no worries. Um, I think it's Councillor Salmon's hand up. Lovely, thank you, Chair. Councillor Salmon, do you want to come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, hi, Jane. Hi. Um, just a quick one, it is. It's on the expertise and capacity. Um, obviously, you're below the levels um, of professional librarians that Welsh Government want. And I think we only have one professional librarian, which is yourself. There's Sean Anthony as well. Sean is she, right, OK. Yes. Going forward, because you're the um, the chief executive now of the trust, um, will will you be looking to to uh, to hire someone else professional uh, that's professionally trained? We are going to need to look at how we manage that. Um, but obviously, as the as one of the through qualified librarians, I would be expecting to still have the, the professional input into the service, whereas I wouldn't be operational any longer. I would still have that professional input, so the strategies and all of the rest of it, so that it fits with the strategies of Wellbeing Murtha, which fit to the Council strategies, which fit to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So I still see a role for myself, but we do need to recruit. Um, um, but as I said, whether that is a straight librarian or whether that is somebody who has qualifications in other areas which can help shape library services in a slightly different way um, for that resilience that we're going to need over the next year, two years. Lovely. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Councillor Salmon. Councillor Smith, did you want to come back in? Bill, your, your microphone is off. Sorry, I've seen you a moment. Jane, I'm, I've asked this question a few times and we, I get a, f a fair answer, but I don't see a lot happening. How can we work stronger with the schools, especially now? Well, well thank you. Um, over the last uh, oh, three to four months, um, Sue Walker, myself and one of my colleagues, Rianne Wen, who does a lot of our marketing and events work, we are looking to do some um, different school activities and events. Um, so Sue and I are, are talking regularly. Um, Sue's been really supportive. We've started work on some Welsh language stuff, which is coming through Sue as well. And we're doing, um, we're going to be doing some stuff around the summer reading challenge, whichever form that is going to take with the schools and how that goes. Um, but alongside that, then we're looking at a large scale Trevithic event for next year. And we're looking at different ways of just pulling the schools into services. One of the things that we've done in the past is a, a, a scheme called Every Child a Library Member where all the, the school children are offered the opportunity to join the library. Um, we need to get back to those types of activity. But how we do that, um, again, I see it very much as this digital person that we need 
to drive some of the digital work forward because I think for some time we aren't going to be having those class visits and school visits and group visits but we offer such a lot digitally so homework help um, online reading clubs all of those things that we've got school packs um, We've done a new brochure for schools, which Sue is going to help to promote across governors and schools and heads. So I think we're, we've, we've started the conversations um, and I think we would have started a lot earlier had last year not happened at all. But, you know, we are where we are, but those conversations are now starting. So, you know, I'm hopeful that that will be a good thing for all of us. As I said, but how can we start like a uh, mini mini libraries in the schools working with the schools changing the books regular because all the years i've asked this yes and we always say we're going to do it times have changed we've got to move on it's a new ball game now for everybody are we, are we engaged everybody and learning is all different so can we mini mini um libraries in schools bits and pieces and freshen the books up as we go along yeah i mean we we did start a community library in bedlin Arc school and it worked quite well under the head that was there um they've had a change of head um so we've got a lot of work now to do, to get back in there um but we we supplied the books we changed the books we do um what we call a young librarian training so we teach the children how to file books how to do books and they volunteer then within their local um within their, their school library what we need and what i think sue will help us to do is to identify people within each school who are going to champion that because we don't have the capacity with only 17 staff and that includes myself as well when i say 17 because we don't have that capacity, we need those champions in the schools as well. So I know that Sue is working hard behind the scenes to identify those people and those names who want to, to push those things forward. Um, you know, we have done some things with Amtaf in the past, but what we find is is once the person leaves, it's, it's difficult to keep the momentum going. And we've got to find a way of, of managing that really. But that's where Sue comes in, and she's been very, very supportive. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Salmon, did you have another question? I do, if you don't mind. Thank you, Chair. Um, Jane, it's it's just it's just up a little. It's um, it's on your Miss Tyville Public Libraries, the future direction. Now, obviously, we've been in a pandemic for a year, and um, I, I believe you've been. People, people could have mem open memberships to the library um, during this. How have you found this? Have you had many new memberships? And with a different question, then with the memberships you've had already, have many people been taking up your service of, of taking, uh, taking, having books delivered and, uh, and that sort of thing? Yeah. The majority of people that we've had who've joined um, the pandemic. Some have joined for, for book deliver, delivery, but we've seen a, a big increase in the, the digital book delivery service that we have um, because obviously we have a lot of services that we buy into as part of a Welsh consortium. So libraries across Wales all pay a small amount, Welsh government pay in as well, and we have a digital service for books, ebooks, magazines, comics, that sort of thing. And those those types of services have been um, have been much more popular than the book delivery side of it. I think there is still that reluctance if you're not a library member, you don't quite know how it works. So there's a lot of work that we need to do to try and put people's minds at rest about how we handle the box, how we make sure that everything is safe, um, because obviously we're quarantining items that are coming back to us, you know, all of these things. But the, the digital services have been the, the thing that most people have come to join for, because obviously that can be done online. They get their membership number very quickly and they're borrowing within minutes of doing it. So it's, it's a very quick service. Uh. Lovely. Thank you, Jane. That is it for me now. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Salmon. Uh, Jane, just a couple of questions I noted down from your responses. So it was more sort of summing up the questions, really. One was around, I remember us talking about the um, the need for librarians and the lack uh, nationwide of qualified librarians. I think we, I remember talking about that the last time you came. Yeah. And I remember actually being one of the ones to question you about it. <laughs> uh, I can't remember what my question was though. But um, but it was, a, what, what I wondered, Jane, was if we've got, um, if we've got a bit of a problem in terms of recruitment and, and people going into that profession, is this something we can do around um, upskilling and training the existing staff? So, for example, things like vocational qualifications like NVQs. I, I think they're called QCFs now, aren't they? Um, but but could you um, could could you do something with the staff that we've got who may very well be interested in in um, you know self improvement and going up the career ladder? Is that something that's been explored? We haven't to any great length. Um, there was a, a delay in some of the new qualifications coming out because there are there are qualifications out there. A uh, colleague, Landry Law, runs a lot of them. And there was a delay in some of the new frameworks coming out for those. But it is certainly something we, we are going to look at because that's how I did it. I mm. came in as a library assistant in Traharis Library part-time because I was going to go on to amazing better things <laughs> but that didn't happen so I you know I did my degree distance learning um, and was supported through work to do that so you know I'm a great advocate of that um, a couple of the people um, who I think may want to go into that have done some family stuff um, and had babies and things like that. And I think we've got two or three people who are ready now to start um, perhaps pushing forward with a, a different career path and different career plan. Yeah, I just think that one of the things we touched on last time, which I guess is still the case, is is how we've already, how we're quite lucky and we've got some incredible staff with us, you know, in, in the libraries. And it just seems like, you know, let's try and be a little bit innovative and use what we've already got rather than relying on a solution from from somewhere, you know. Um, so that's really good to hear, Jane. Um, the other thing was... I picked up when you mentioned about the IT and the upskilling and the need for, 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 for more people to, to learn how to use IT. And it's something I've been sort of talking about in most forums when it becomes relevant. And I really feel for all the, the older people and not necessarily, I don't mean to put people into, into boxes, but it is, in my experience, it's predominantly older people the struggle with those IT skills, they might not even have any. And they're the ones that's going to be most hit by the pandemic because they wouldn't have had the access to what we're doing right now. They wouldn't have been able to necessarily do their shopping online. They wouldn't have been able to use the online library service. So there's a real um, section of our society that would have suffered even more than, than, than everybody else because of that lack of IT skills. So it just made me wonder, um, when things do start to get back to some semblance of normality, are there, are there things in the pipeline um, to offer courses for older people or anybody who's got um, IT skills for beginners then? Is, is there anything in, in the pipeline for that, Jane? I mean, we, we've always worked with a lot of different partners to do that type of work. And I mean, I think if, you, if in the report we highlighted the, the bus pass debacle, as we like to call it, because we helped over 6,000 people who had no way of getting their bus pass otherwise. If we hadn't been there to help them, they wouldn't have been able to do it. So, you know, we know that there's a massive skills gap and that those older people do struggle. Um, we've done some things in the past where we've had silver surfers groups. We've got um, quite a few sort of volunteer organisations who work out of the libraries and do classes and activities. But what we've found recently is that funding tends to be pushed now towards um, people who have a qualification at the end. And not everybody coming into us, in fact, the majority of people coming into us, they're not interested in a qualification. They're just interested yeah. in learning their little bit. 
So that's where the thought comes around the, the having somebody within our staff responsible for digital skills. Um, maybe it's a level two learner support system qualification that they need to help people get to that, that point that they want to learn rather than you know pushing them down the path of an accredited course that they really not interested in so that's you know that that is another thing that we're looking at um i can imagine though that that would be you know a, a good way down the line at the moment just because of social distancing issues um within our buildings they they aren't great for it okay so the, just to pick up on it council smith talked about schools but i wonder <clears throat> whether in the future there could be some joint working initiative with the um organizations that that have the most contact with that with that target audience whether yeah. it be housing associations or whether it be community groups because they will know firsthand who were the people who are more likely to um to benefit from from those courses and i know that um i know that you the the trust is doing they've done quite a lot of uh, fundraising recently so it was just just a question really about making sure that that's on the um the the horizon and that it's not forgotten really no, um go on jane oh i was just going to say it's it's something i think that everybody has learned from during this period is that there are there are people who are very excluded now. I know I know Councillor Davis when he he's done work for us. Um, he's supported one particularly vulnerable older lady who is desperately trying to engage and can't because of IT issues plus the inability to to actually operate a system. Um, yeah. He's done a lot of work around that for us, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. Okay, thanks, Jane. The other the other thing I noted down was following up on Councillor Jones asking about when libraries would reopen. And my question was, I suppose I was after a little bit more clarity, really, Jane. So you, you talked about um, a sort of uh, click and collect and that sort of thing. Um, but with shops opening it from the 12th of April, um, they would have put in certain measures in order to open up. What, could you clarify for me, are you opening the same as the shops or are you not opening and just doing click and collect? I wasn't sure. Yeah, we'll be in the first instance, we'll be doing click and collect um, because what we've got to be mindful of is that our procedures and processes mean that we have to um, quarantine our stock for 72 hours because right. the guidance we have is that because our books are covered in plastic, the paper and the card of the book is fine, but the plastic cover that protects it um, can carry the virus for up to 72 hours. So all of our stock coming back in has to be quarantined, which means that it would be very difficult to operate anything near a normal, just come in and see and browse um, because of that issue around the quarantining of stock. There's a lot of work going on in um, England at the moment um, around how they are going to come out of the sort of tiers that they're in. And because we're all part of a network within libraries, they are sharing that information with us as a society, society of Chief Librarians Wales. And we're doing a lot of work collaboratively around what it means within each area um, because Welsh Government are very clear that it has to be on strong risk assessment and it has to be, um, we have to be mindful of the local environment as well. Yeah. So where we're in a position where numbers are rising in Merthyr at the moment, we are going to take a more cautious approach, whereas maybe in Pembrokeshire, they'll be able to, to open more quickly than we will. Um, but, you know, we, our eye is on, on the prize of having people back into our buildings when we can and when we safely can. Lovely. Thank you, Jane. Um, so I think that's it on the questions. Does anybody have any comments before we move on? I don't see any. Oh, there we go. Councillor Jones. Yes, just quickly. Um, I just want to uh, thank uh, Jane and all the staff of for the work that they've undertaken, particularly during the last 
12 months because like all uh, other, uh, I know you, you, you're a, a trust now, but it's, it's the same aspect. People have had to change and, and diversify the way they do things. And as well as our own directly employed staff, in the local authority, everyone has stepped up to the mark. Um, it, it's really been, frankly, uh, astounded to me how well um, staff have carried out different ways of working. So it's really a thank you to you and the other 60 members of staff in the library service for what they do. And um, I commend you for the excellent detailed report that you've put before the scrutiny committee this afternoon. Any other comments, but Councillor Smith? Councillor Smith, your microphone is off. Thank you for getting that. Anyway, to support what Clive just said, I think you've done it. The job you're doing overall is fabulous because it's a, it's a connection, people are concerned, people got to read. So no, I think what we've done in this report is excellent, what we've done last year. But again, it'd be a different report this year. But again, what the work we've done and say thank them at all the staff of the committee, because I think they've done an excellent job. Thank you. OK, any other comments? Just just Chair, for myself. Sorry. Chair, the... I would like to make a comment, but I can't put the hands up, so I can't. You're not going to see my hand going up because there's something wrong with the system, which is debarring me from uh, putting the hand up. But if you would allow me to come in now, um, like other members this afternoon, um, my congratulations and thanks go out to uh, Jane and the staff. Um, after reading uh, page nine, that's the executive summary, I could see then that as far as the library services uh, is concerned, you, you know, we've got nothing to worry about. Everything is working in our favour. So the executive summary basically gave me what I needed to have, and I quickly went through the report before coming on to uh, page 31, which is entitled The Future Direction. And if you come, if members come down to the last but one paragraph, Jane has recorded in there, the world is a different place now and the plans are doing, and so it is. So she has recognised that, you know, we're not going to change anything tomorrow. It's going to be a gradual change based on different thinking from year on in. And that to me was uh, a very good page within the report. That's the future future uh, direction. So Jane, once again, thank you very, very much for this report. Um, and that goes also to the staff within the department. Thank you. Uh, OK, thank you, Councillor Jones. Um, yeah, uh, Jane, just to, just to reiterate what the councillors have said, you know, I've always been a huge fan of the library and a supporter of the library services as a whole. So uh, I wish you well in the future and thank you for your time today. And just before we end, I just want to go back to the recommendations 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3, just to make sure that we're confident that we've done what the, in, the recommendations set out today. And they were for us to, re to receive information on feedback, uh, retrospectively ratify the report, 
and uh, the feedback report is accepted and committee members have an opportunity to review and comment on its content. So I think, um, you know, I'm confident that we've achieved those recommendations um, and uh, if everybody's happy with that, we can um, thank you, Jane, for your time. And Jane, I'm assuming you want to go now? Or are you I, saying the rest of the meeting? That, I, I move that recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Jane, did you want to uh, stay for the rest of the meeting or are you leaving us? <laughs> I, I leave you and you can enjoy the rest of your meeting. <laughs> Can you take a vote on the recommendations? Chair, can you take a vote? Can you take a vote on the recommendations? Councillor Jones has moved it. I'll I'll second it, Mike. Thank you, uh, Fred. Do you, do you, Chair, do you want to take a vote now? Yeah. I think that's everybody with, uh, voted, with voting now, Mayor, isn't it? With voting yes, power. Chair, yes. Yeah, chair. lovely. Right, thank you. Okay, if every, everyone could put their hands down now, including me, bear with me. Okay, so uh, moving on. We now have. Um, if I could refer you to page 33 of the report and agenda item number four is the recovery, transformation and improvement plan. Um, just to give somebody trying to speak there. No? OK, I could get a bit of interference then. Can everybody make sure their microphones are off? Because I'm getting a little bit of interference. Um, OK, so just to give a brief introduction, the, this report um, should provide an overview of how the priority actions laid down in this plan link in with other key plans and strategies to which the Council must respond, providing assurance of the effectiveness of the governance arrangements and enable members to explore opportunities to review streamlining where appropriate and support efficient delivery uh, and it's worth noting that um, we there has been um, a couple of workshops the most recent one being yesterday where um, further developments for the, the role of scrutiny and how that factors into the recovery plan were discussed with all elected members um, so I'm not quite sure who's doing the introduction to this one anybody could uh, somebody say who, who wanted yeah, to do an it, Yeah, it's me, Chair, Lisa. OK, thank you, Lisa. So if I could just go to the recommendations first off. And the recommendation is 2.1 on page 34 of the report. The contents of this report be noted and debated. And uh, with that in mind, if I could hand over to Lisa um, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, as you just alluded to, uh, members um, have had uh, a couple of workshops now. Um, what I intend to do, what I propose to do is just give you, you know, some key points, salient points from the summary of the report and then just some key headlines from the, the uh, content of the report and then hand over uh, the matter to colleagues to ask questions and any observations, Chair, if that's OK with you. Um, so obviously, with support provided by Welsh Government, the Council responded by developing this recovery transformation improvement plan commonly called the RTI plan meeting the time scale set by the minister and obviously during the development of the RTI plan the council and its support identified three priority areas which are depicted within the body of this report improving standards in education increasing resilience and social care and economic recovery following of course uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic um, the first of the RTI plan was shared with senior officers back in August 2020, and then the first opportunity for elected members to have sight of it was back in September 2020, where um, together we looked and agreed the priority areas, key underpinning principles and areas to support the change. And these included environmental well-being, digital transformation, commercial opportunities, healthy organisation, and of course, government um, improvement. 
So key um, areas of work have been and are being developed to deliver the RTI plan and in doing so addressing the findings of the rapid assessment exercise carried out by the quality, um, by sorry, the assurance board. And the plan then supports and enables us, you know, to have um, efficient and effective delivery of that, uh, as well as the council's corporate plan and wellbeing objectives moving forward. We've already mentioned those workshops, Chair, so what I'll do is just bring to your attention some the key points, as I said, on page 34. Well, why do we need an RTI plan? Well, the plan um, is, is vitally important because it does address um, out the outcomes and it does develop uh, the transformation improvement plan for us and supports that uh, back from 2020 uh, to 2021. As I said, with support from um, the Assurance Board and, and Welsh Government advisors as well. The plan considers the three essential elements, uh, that is our recovery from the coronavirus pandemic, our transformation, things we need to change to increase sustainability and improve upon that, and leading, of course, to our improvement, addressing the key performance issues to improve, improve all outcomes for our residents. Towards the end of page 35, I think it's quite um, important to address uh, these points, and that is that we needed to recover from the pandemic, uh, and as we you know, slowly move out of that and transform the way we work, this means that we needed to learn from how we've worked through the pandemic and take forward aspects of working practices that have benefited us and in doing so applying, of course, the five ways of working from the Wellbeing Future Generations uh, Wales Act. So I think that is important to note as well. Throughout the body of the report, there is lots that, lots that talk about, you know, those key areas, um, the key areas supporting the plan that I've already mentioned. Of course, those well-being objectives as well. Um, and throughout delivering the plan, we will not only improve outcomes for um, in our corporate plan, but as I said, also improve how we contribute to the seven national well-being goals as well. Um, there's information in there as to where we were. I'm looking forward, of course. I'm talking about where we are now and what the future holds. So I'll just touch on a key couple of points. We have developed a number of programmes under some of those key areas, one being key strategies and, of course, the Raising Aspirations, Raising Standards strategy, the RAS strategy, you know, improving education for the young people in Merthyr Tidville. Uh, social services, using digital technology to continue and provide key services to our residents through the pandemic, developing approved key pieces of work in delivering the RTI plan. One of those, of course, are peripatetic social workers posts to um, provide peripatetic um, support services for our children's services. Um, moving on again. Um, I, I have to mention this, I have mentioned it in council several times, but if you can imagine supporting residents, supporting businesses throughout the pandemic, um, we had uh, our teams uh, with our cabinet member, Andrew Barry, um, leading on that as well with officers and delivering over £22 million worth as of uh, the 23rd of February in um, grants to support local businesses. A phenomenal piece of work, and that is, of course, part of this RTI plan and moving that forward as well. So there's a lot in there, Chair. Um, as I said, we've discussed it in our workshops. I think vitally for us as well, it was to include uh, both our elected members and scrutiny members as well. And of course, we are doing that and doing that clearly today. And we will continue to do that as well. On page 41, there's an outline there of uh, where we want to be. At 7.1, of course, it is important that we continue to drive forward our recovery, transformation and improvement agenda. And we want to use workshops to further refine the RTI plan and, um, of course, work with everybody who's, who's in this virtual environment today, as well as our, our other councillors. So we will continue to strengthen our governance, including our scrutiny. And as you know, we have a workshop planned as well to engage uh, members in that. And in conclusion, Chair, as I said, just at uh, 8.1 to 8.6 there, it does contribute to the wellbeing objectives as well. Um, I'll finish there, Chair. There is uh, hopefully, you know, members have had an opportunity, colleagues have had an opportunity to, to look at the report in front of you today and obviously to, to reflect on the workshops that we've already had. Um, so happy for myself and our officers to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Tanya. OK, thank you, Lisa. Um, so before we go into questions, I just wanted to ask the committee. I know in the past when we've had a report similar to this, um, there's been a request to go through in a more um, 
specific way, so page by page. How do the committee want to do this with questions? Do you want to just do a general overview of questions for the for the whole for the whole report? Or would you like to go through um each element of the report individually and questions on each one? Clive, I can see your hand is up. Yeah, I, I got two questions, but to answer your question, Chair, I would suggest that um, if we went through it page by page, people got a particular question, you you know, uh, and you'll find it um, an easier sequence, I think, to go through the report. Thank you. Clive, so you suggest in page by page? Yes, I mean, if you started on page 34 and then carried on from there, OK, so just to clarify, we'll be going through from pages 44 through to 51. Yeah. Because that's the main body of the report the, it, it, in effect is the slides, isn't it? If we were to look at them as slides. Yeah, that would be the main body of the report. So if we start off on page 44, if I could refer everybody Chair, in the... So, sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm using the council website, uh, the agenda papers on that, so pages 44 to whatever. I don't know, I can't follow that, to be honest. Can you see, so, can you see on the screen, Councillor Sam, when we've got the report on the screen? Maria can probably get it up first. Yeah, you've got four sections, 5.5 .5 to 5.8. That's uh, that's not good enough, to be honest. Uh, when, when you're going through the questions, would you be able to go three, name the um, name the item 3.4, 3.5, just so we can follow, if that's OK? Well, what, well, I was actually going to go through the actual report itself, Councillor Sam, and rather than the... Um, 7.1, 7 7.2. 7 I was going it's to go through. Still can't follow that, so you'll have to make it easier. Can you, can, when you are going through the report, can you just make it uh, clarify exactly uh, what you are on? Because following it on the council website is a little bit more different, difficult. Councillor Sam, just out of curiosity, is it? How come you can't see the screen with Maria's? Um, Maria's I can't on see there? the screen. I can you see can't. the screen, but. I can, but if you look at the screen, you've got introduction, background, background, introduction and background, 3.1 and 3.2. It's not what we would have uh, looked at last night. Yeah, Maria, could you, get, could you get page 44 up on the screen for us, please? OK, so at the moment, uh, Councillor Skinner, I'm controlling the screen, but I can pass it over so as Maria can do it if you want. Yes, to, to, please, make it easier, to make it easier, to make it easier, Chair. If you just go through it, and then if we've got questions at the end, maybe uh, maybe members can uh, can answer or ask them then. Well, okay. Chair, I, I, I'm going to throw a span in the works because my two questions are on the overarching report on page forty. Well, Clive, you can't have it both ways. <laughs> You either go through page by page of the report or we just do general overview questions as we normally would. Let's let's keep it general. Let's keep it general on the overall report and do it and, and do it member by member as we normally would. I know in the past that that, that hasn't gone down so well, but, but being as this has led to so much confusion, let's just do it that way. Clive, if you give me your questions and we'll just do a general overview. Well, on page 40 in uh, paragraph 5.12, it refers to uh, a healthy organisation and it goes on to say improving the way we're recruiting and monitoring staff performance by improving our digital offer. Um, I know that we're on the, the first rung of a very long ladder, um, but what work has been done uh, so far as far as this issue is concerned, because I just feel that it's um, very important as an authority in these um, modern age, how we go about recruiting and monitoring staff performance digitally. Shall I take that question, Chair? Yeah. Um, so we currently operate a software system within the local authority called Frontier, which is our main HR and payroll system for the authority. What we have 
procured via that system is a software aspect in which we can more, more, um, manage performance for our staff via e-performance. So you'll be aware that last year the council reinitiated our focus on the performance um, procedure within the local authority. So that's where managers have their one-to-one -one conversations with their staff, set their performance targets, and then undertake their reviews then on a weekly basis, and then a quarterly basis. What the proposal is, is to put that to a digital platform whereby staff can use that process in a digital manner then, hopefully from this year going forward. In terms then of recruitment, currently we use a, a paper-based recruitment process. And again, as part of the Frontier system, we've purchased an e-recruitment module, which allows our recruitment process to be completely digitalized. So right from the very start, we undertake your application as a potential applicant, right through then to the interview stage within the local authority. And again, that's going to take a number of months to roll out within the authority because it's all staff training, both within HR and with the managers and our recruiting managers itself as well. So if we did the initial stages under the healthy organisation plan. Thank you for that, uh, Fran, through you, Chair. Um, so the the, the e-commerce uh, model um, for recruitment, um, is that... How, how long will that take to, is it already started or will that, is that something that can be done within a short space of time? So it will take a considerable time to roll out, but we're anticipating that it will be rolled out by the end of the year. Um, the, the software rollout as it currently stands is what's called version 5 upgrade at the moment in relation to the front end platform for our users. So that's our staff and the managers in the organisation. So that needs the initial upgrade. Then it will be the e-performance upgrade to the system, followed by the e-recruitment um, upgrade to the system then. But we anticipate that they, they will all be completed this year. So all applicants who apply for any job would be able to do it digitally by December of this year. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Right. Good. Um, I'm glad to see the progress on that. Um, my other question is relation to 51 Point one three, the commercial opportunities. Um, could it, could I ask? Because um, I know that um, I've asked the question uh, a few weeks ago um, of I think it's Dan and Owen uh, gave an answer. They you were looking at what a, a commercial manager requires to undertake in this particular authority. I presume you're looking at the person specification, the job description, etc. So how far have we got with that? And at what stage, how many months are we away from being in a position to get this particular advert um, as close as to what we want it to be? and what we want the person, him or her, to be doing in Merthyr Tidville. Chair, shall I come in there? Yeah. Sorry, so I, I, thought, I th Sorry, Alice, I thought Fran was going to come in on that one, but Alice, if you feel you can answer, that's fine. Is well, Fran I'm, still with us? I'm yes, sure. yeah, sorry, go on, Alice. Yeah, no, sorry. Um, it's, uh, I can part answer Clive's um, uh, question really at the moment. I'm going to have to, and we'll have to come back to you with a further update in terms of time scale. So, um, Alan has been looking, as we've had dialogue before, in terms of what uh, exactly as you articulated there, Clive. What does a commercial manager need to look like for Merthyr? Uh, and it's you know it's not it's not something we can pick off the shelf really. Um, so. The work has been done on job description and, and uh, Alan has been looked at that. I do believe, and Fran will correct me if I'm wrong, that we, we are looking at the, the job evaluation criteria uh, against that job description. Um, but really speaking, what Alan is trying to uh, formulate is how we take forward the commercial strategy itself as well with you know and the the commercial manager is just one facet of that because it, the opportunities that we are trying to craft from a you know there's 
there's a generic uh, commercial uh, stance for the organization in terms of everything we do. If, if there's a commercial opportunity, we make sure we exploit it. But equally, there's there's um, crafting uh, commercial opportunities of their own right, um, which is what we want to explore and develop, you know, in terms of making best utilization of our land assets. You know, can we actually generate income um, from our land, uh, such as looking at uh, renewable energies, opportunities, um, you know, any, anything we can actually bring an income into the authority under a commercial banner is, is part of that thinking and strategy, which, you know, it hasn't been done. You know, lots, lots of authorities are have dipped their toe in the water to that. And some authorities, especially in England, have been burnt seriously by uh, by doing that in the wrong uh, guise, potentially. Uh, and that's why we're trying to make sure that we we craft a commercial strategy which is sound and, and the right fit for Merth, I presume. I mean. Now, what I'll do is I'll come back to you in terms of the timelines, because I'm not quite sure if we're at the stage where we can go to advert as yet. Clive, but um, Fran may update more if she if she's got more on the time scale thing. But um, if I speak to Alan and come back to you, and I can update uh, scrutiny with a timeline in terms of our expected delivery of that. Um, but we're moving forward as quickly as we can with the commercial strategy. But I'm not quite sure where we are with um, the manager yet. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Ellis. Change Sorry, Ellis. Um, it was just to follow up on Councillor Jones's question, really, around the commercial manager. It just I know it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation, but surely the manager would be responsible for part of the strategy. I just yeah, it, it just I, occurred that, to me. Yes, and they would be obviously, but I think in order to define the skill set we're looking to acquire, we need a general broad theme. You know, so are we looking for somebody with experience in property development and management, that type of that type of aspect, or is it or you know, um as I've mentioned it, uh, you know, a pure commercial investment at, at, at angle that we want to get a skill set. And that in fairness to Alan, that's what we're trying to define based on engaging with other authorities and seeing what, what opportunities we have. OK, thank you, Alice. It was just to uh, so so we've got to we've got to clarify and confirm our vision before we can pass that on and employ somebody to enact it. Right. I get it now. Thank you, Alice. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. On, on this commercial manager, it's a good idea, but I'd like to know more, more detail on what you do as a person. Because you read in the paper, football commercial managers, managers this. I make a mess. I like to know what we what we expect to have of the commercial manager. You say what's the, what his role is, and uh, can we give? Because if it goes pear ship, the council doesn't have the fault. Nobody else. So I like to go, make sure everything's all the eggs are in the basket, nice and tidy, and we can take it forward. No, I can I can completely understand that, Councillor Smith, and I think. That's what, um, when we've got clarity in terms of what we're advising for council, we'll come back to um, both council as part of the workshops, obviously we're briefing you in, uh, and you know we can come back to scrutiny as you wish um, and give an update in terms of, look, the, this is our thinking, this is the, the avenue we want to explore with going to market for a commercial manager, and this is the expectation what that role would look like, uh, and also the remit we'd be expecting it to fulfil. So yes, can certainly, uh, I can understand the concerns because I share some of those as well we've got to make sure it's right um but that and that's why we, we we're taking some time to make sure we properly define exactly what we want and need check and i come back for a second, a second hey let's go we have do you know anybody is in that role can anybody come back to us and explain what what they what what the council expect to come out of a, a commercial manager because you know you know about can we make enough money can we I always thought the local thought you couldn't make it any profit to go back into the system. So I do in fact the role of change as well. Yeah, um I think Steve's on a call and he, he may correct me if I'm wrong, but you can you can certainly um use it's you can recover costs obviously up to a point, but depending on how we if we look at a, a legal entity in terms of commercial arm, then that changes that picture. Um so you know you can have a trading arm as an authority. 
uh, and a, a lot of authorities have looked at that model um, and we, we wouldn't be alone. And so some surrounding authorities have commercial um, uh, managers or directors um, charged with this uh, similar sort of remit. So I, I know Blind and Gwent has uh, followed that model. Um, but yeah, certainly we can. We, what, what I suggest is that we, we can uh, better define that and come back and give a proper briefing if you want. Yeah, I'd rather, sorry, Chair, I'd rather do that. At least I know what I'm on about because I, I know a lot of people that's gone in that line and they just flip themselves through some of, some of these work and cause problems. I think, I think I think just to sort of just to uh, just to, con to just to sort of um, I, how can I say uh, interpret the discussion um, I think from what Ellis has said is that it's going to be we're going to be along for the journey all the way through Ellis aren't we we have been with these workshops and I think certainly for the future the intention is for us to be you know part of that process not just in terms of the commercial manager, but in terms of setting that vision as well through the, well, through this plan. You're you're absolutely right, Chair. So the the the, the int our intention as we set out the engagement strategy for the RTI plan, uh, as you will all be party to, uh, not just uh, elected members but scrutiny members as well, is that we want to have the workshop re regular workshops as we've agreed that you form part of shaping the journey uh, and what's right for the authority and, and for the people of Merthyr uh, and that's the way we're approaching it. So yeah, you'll be very much involved in the dialogue in terms of how we take the plan forward. But if, if there's a specific scrutiny element you want us to come back on, absolutely we can do that. But you certainly, I, I take Councillor Smith's um, both concerns and his point, but we, we'll certainly be having that dialogue uh, as soon as we've got some clarity to bring back in, uh, you know, one of the either one of the workshops or a separate briefing anyway. Well, Ellis, I know that um, one of the things that we, I, I, I can't speak for the other committees, but certainly for the governance committee, we, we you know, we are keen on um, on us becoming more proactive because what we tend, what tends to happen at the moment is things will come across scrutiny once it's already been. It's either towards the end of the process or the process is already finished and then we're sort of doing it retrospectively. So anything that, that involves us in that sort of that formation process and that initial sort of giving that giving a being that critical friend and when we're forming and thinking of ideas, that would always be welcome. Um, so on that note, I think Councillor Jones has got another question. Yes, um, well, I've got an, another two questions on page 41 and 42, Chair. Yeah. Uh, if I can take you to um, 5.17, uh, and that refers to the 705,000 uh, as a result of the first phase of the capacity exercise. Um, it mentions a second phase. So, can someone, one of the officers, confirm to me that the second phase, will this be the second phase of a capacity exercise? And um, will this be included in the budget for the year 22-23? So I'll, I'll bring Steve in with regards to the budget uh, and the year allocation. But um, so yes, just to, just to explain. So the first phase of the capacity exercise was very much around uh, looking at capacity against the statutory provision and what, what we've subsequently discussed in terms of underpinning the RTI plan and following, you know, um, out, in a very short um, time in the future, we'll bring the Wales Audit Office report um, to council. Um, the, there are additional challenges with regard to our capacity for us to transform the organisation. And so there's rec we've had recommendations from Wales Audit Office, recommendations from um, the Welsh Government advisors in terms of plugging uh, parts of capacity in order to better underpin the transformation journey. And that's why the second lens we want to look at the capacity of the organisation in is against our ability to transform. Uh, and so there are a couple of issues that we will, where we're currently trying to cost and, and uh, look at at the moment in terms of underpinning the entire RTI plan. So it is very much our intention to bring that back in, you know, it'll be a series of reports, depends on the area of, con of concern. 
but it would form almost a phase two of uh, capacity uh, exercise where we would um, uh, bring those together in a summary report really. But uh, Steve may want to comment in terms of the timing of that, but because it's an ongoing piece of work Clive at the moment. Yes, if I could comment Chair on that one, it's just the case that at this present time, uh, Miss, as you are aware, we have only included the first phase as part of the MTFP. So once we um, identify exactly what the cost will be in going forward, and obviously as well, there might be some efficiencies coming out of that investment as well, then that will be factored as part of the NTFP in going forward. And as Ellis has alluded to as well, uh, we're currently looking at costing out our TI plan and trying to identify what efficiencies might be falling out of that investment and over the next number of years. Thank you for that. Um, it takes me then to 7.5 on page 42, which is referred to how to consider how we fill any skill and capacity gaps uh, as we change the way we work and improve. Um, and during the middle of that paragraph, it states, and I quote, we will consider how we can use external funding to help us achieve this. Um, we have already committed financial support to the R RTA plan, etc. So can either Steve or Ellis uh, explain to the committee chair what external funding uh, we are talking about uh, and how much money that's likely to be? I, I can see Andrew, I Andrew, Andrew. Andrew wants to come in. Yeah, uh, just quickly, uh, Chair, on, on that. Um, there's a regional transformation, digital transformation fund. Uh, which we've committed to in the region of around 125,000 working with neighbouring local authorities. Um, and we look in in the future then to build on that to the next phase, which I think is around 250,000. If I can get you the actual figures. Oh, what we, what's happened here? Clive, you're uh, on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, if this is a regional fund and there's a number of other authorities there, um, doesn't seem to me to be a, a massive sum of money under 25,000. So do we put bids in for that? And is there an assessment panel as to whether we'll be eligible for whatever amount we're asking for? Uh, so it's Welsh Government funding, uh, Councillor, and it, it it comes in stages, it does. So the alpha phase is always around 120. The beta phase are, I think, around 200 and something. And then future phases are higher. So they set amounts um, where you have to bid to Welsh Government. So it is assessed, but you have to work with other local authorities to put the bid in. So, so it's 125,000, for example, for this next financial year. And the next year, it'll be an even bigger sum of money. Is that right? Uh, it, I, I think it's per. I think I think the the first phase actually is is three to six months, so right. it's a project as opposed to they giving money to the local authority. There's that 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 amount of money we're accessing as part of a project uh, to look at a particular thing. In this case, is it's um, our use of data and data systems. You you can put in a number of bids if needed. So just to be quite crystal clear in my mind. Um, the 125,000, which has been administered by the uh, Welsh government, we are able to tap into some of that in the next three to six months. So are we already down that road and, and got our applications in? Yes, the expression of interest went in last Friday with the lead authority being around the Cunnan Taff. Right, so uh, can, I, uh, is it, can I ask how much money we've asked for? Is that, yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah, we're at. Um, it, yeah, I don't think it's commercially sensitive. Uh, we're at the beta stage now, so whatever that beta stage of money, it's a set amount of money um, that that we would be bidding for, and I, I think it's in the region of two hundred thousand. But I'd, I'd have to check the paperwork. 
So you're hoping that we'll have success with that, and we should know within the next three to six months. Hopefully sooner than that, councillor. But yes, yeah, we should know shortly, and then we can move on to the next stage of that project. So if we're successful, that tranche of money, um, what exactly was it going to be used for? You know, I presume straight away. Okay, um, so there's staffing involvement in there as part of the project team. Um, and there's part then uh, funding of the, the hardware and software required. So it, it's, it's a digital project, so that, that then would cover those across the, the, the four local authorities involved in there. Right, and are we talked about obviously uh, temporary staff on that then? It would obviously yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they temporary for the length of the project then. And sorry, and how long is the length of the project? Um, I, I believe the members of staff were fixed term for a year, but again, I'd have to clarify that. Right, right, okay. Right, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Um, I've got a question. I'm not quite sure whether, Councillor Salmon, I can see your hand come up. I'll come to you next. I'm not quite sure whether my question would be better to Ellis or Andrew. It was just in terms of, um, we're at a point in, in, in the year now where as a committee, we will be looking to form our work programme for next year. And given that the, uh, the, the, the makeup and the purpose of this committee, as in governance overarching and being very strategic and everything that was discussed in the workshop yesterday. Can you foresee us needing to factor in um, elements into our work programme and what would that what would that look like? OK, so uh, I, <laughs> do, do you want to go first now? No, uh, no uh, well, I, I was just going to say, you know, so the short answer is yes. Um, I, I think the um, the challenge, uh, the change uh, that is going on currently with regards to governance, as we covered yesterday, social economic duty, the changes to um, the act, we, we're clearly going to have to, oh, sorry, as scrutiny, you're clearly going to have to make space for looking at how the organisation is adopting those changes robustly and making sure that the governance changes are in place and filtering through the organisation. So that would be my short answer to that. Um, I think um, we need to look at um, helping you, I suppose, uh, plan out that um, series of challenge from a scrutiny perspective, um, because we are in the midst of significant change organisationally. There's significant change legislatively and obviously with the current pandemic still it's still going on there's the external factor and unknowns of what the pandemic is also bringing which has an impact on our governance and be able to respond to it so there's a there's a lot uh, it's very difficult to to get a plan there but i think there's some clear categories we could definitely build in but my advice was would it be as well we also need to build in some flexibility to uh, focus on things as they happen um, yeah. So, but I, I, I'll, I'll pass over to Andrew now. That's my two pennies to start with, Jay. Thank you. Yeah, I, well, I, I think you've covered it all there. To be honest, Ellis, I, I, I think when we look at our forward plans, uh, we need to marry them up with the RTI plan. But also, what you say there, there's got to be some flexibility because the, the, the workshops themselves that we have in are refining that plan. And if we do notice that there are things that we do need to bring to scrutiny as a result of that refining then we would we should have the flexibility to do so or you should have the flexibility to do so andrew can i suggest then and maybe i speak to you separately um because we this year we have we've we have taken that flexible approach with the work program it's been very fluid and we purposely kept each month we've because we've done scrutiny more often this year because there was a gap with the pandemic um but we purposely kept each uh, meeting light in order to be able to slot in uh, items as and when they came. So we've remained quite fluid and we're happy to do that going forward. But I wonder whether I could meet with you separately as part of the planning for next year's work programme. And then I can take that forward then to the committee um, separately to discuss, you know, how they feel about it. Yeah, absolutely. I welcome that, Chair. Yeah, absolutely. 
Thank you, Andrew. I'll, I'll, I'll do that separately then. I'll arrange a meeting after this meeting. Um, Deck Councillor Salmon. Lovely. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to go back. To, it's a it's a broad question. This is probably for Lisa or maybe for for Ellis. Um, the summary the summary of the report. Um, one point five. The last sentence of that it says, if successful in delivering the recovery transformation and improvement plan, the council will no longer requ require su support from the board. Have you had any feedback from the board? And when are you looking at, uh, are we looking at uh, getting out from under them? Thank you, Declan. Yeah, if I may answer that, Chair, if that's OK. Um, yeah, so um, obviously since, since coming on board and following on the work for, from last year that, that my predecessor, uh, Kevin O'Neill, has done with the board as well and taking on that mantra then um, in the new year, um, some of my first discussions with the board was talking about um, an exit strategy. Um, colleagues who sit on the assurance board will know that in the second meeting that I had with them, um, I brought that up as um, a point to note because inevitably, um, all of this work that we are doing will improve Merthyr Tydfil. It'll improve the council services that we provide. It'll support officers, members, residents alike. So, you know, there's very positive action taking place. And whilst the Assurance Board is supportive, challenging, taking us forward, that is something that I wanted from them uh, as well as your leader. You know, it was basically saying to them, look, you know, we're really driving forward. We've still got, you know, journeys ahead of us. And some of those may take us 12 to, you know, 12 months, two years, you know, further in, in that sort of transition process, if you like. Um, but I certainly asked them for an exit plan, uh, Councillor Salmon. Um, I got that. Fortunately, I got agreement that they would look at that um, uh, without confirming that because I am meeting with the board this week. I'm pleased to say that, that they are negotiating with me and um, I'll be able to confirm that with all members shortly. Um, and I'm hoping to look at, um, you know, autumn winter uh, exit strategy with them um the minister and uh, her officers also welcomed that you know as a challenge from us if you like so um yeah i think you know that i'm really pleased the way this is going as i said this this isn't in this infancy officers and and previous members have worked hard on this over over the last 18 months and we are continuing that and driving that forward so yeah de definitely the uh, declan and, and definitely moving forward on that um with support from the assurance board i will say yeah thank you Lovely. Thank you, Lisa. Just one other question now, and it's it's a little bit like that, but it's kind of uh, it's maybe looking at other other local authorities as well. Um, Lisa's just said all the work being undertaken will improve uh, Merthyr Tydfil, which is great, and I'm sure all members will welcome that. Now, part of the capacity exercise, um, the council are putting uh, seven hundred and five thousand uh, pounds. They're investing that in staffing levels now. I think all this, the Assurance Board, came about after the audit meeting on really Monday 29th of April 2019, which is less than 12 months into the independent administration. And bearing in mind that um, uh, the previous administration, the, the current administration will be working on the previous administration's um, budget for, for the first 12 months, so 11 months into the, that administration. Um, all these things are raised, so, so I think it's quite obvious that obviously obvious that not enough investment has obviously gone into in, into the council since two thousand and eight, probably since uh, the financial crash. So I'm just wondering, has has Welsh government done other rapid assessments of of other local authorities? Because we can't be alone, you know, and and you can't blame one administration over another, to be honest, because it, it, it it's obviously down to lack of uh, lack of funding. Um, so have we done? Have they done other assessments? And 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 my question is then, what what is the state of other local authorities if they've done those rapid assessments? 
Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Deck. Yeah, there have been other uh, rapid assessments. Um, we can certainly bring some detail on that to show some comparisons to other local authorities. Um, obviously, different sizes, different population, different natures to some of those uh, rapid assessments that, that they've done. Um, and as I said, we can bring that to you. I think where we're at at this point in time, Merthyr is not alone. I think that, um, you know, they can see the work that we are doing. And I know um, Welsh Audit Office have, have found um, some issues, some similar issues, some indifferent issues with other local authorities and, and working with them now. Um, I can't name them for you at this particular juncture, but I'm certain that we can get that information and bring it to, to another scrutiny for you. Lovely. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Salmon. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. I read a report. I'm looking for for the environmental side of it. How can we really look at that? Because you look around all our areas, streets, side streets, the mess is unbelievable. Right? I'm on the street light there and not up the standard. Can we have a look at changing some of the names and like keeps um keep those streets safe and cleaner? Because I don't know if anybody be in the top of town after eight o'clock in the night, so I'll, I'll go through it. How scary it is, it's so dark up there. And the town centre is not so clever in the daytime. People are concerned. You you walk around the town centre in the daytime, people are very concerned. But I'm looking at this overall because I don't know where we get in. People, we've been closed down for 12 months, 18 months. People are coming out now and people are, see a difference. They're looking around, they see a difference. You see a difference in mess because when they're all about all the time and you're out all the time, you don't take much notice. Now people have been staying in, they're coming back out and they see him more and they talk him more. So how can we, how can we look at that? Because I'm more concerned about the street like then. And we and I go four yeah, I've I go four granddaughters and they're only twenties, they're all crackers, and I'm concerned anything could happen. Uh, Chair, if I may take that one and then perhaps one of the officers can add to that one. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Councillor Smith, for that. Um, I think, you know, over recent weeks, um, we've all been perhaps uh, reminded how safe we need to be within our communities and how we need to be supported with that. What I can add to that, just to give perhaps some reassurance to you, is that um, as uh, our town ward colleagues will know, there has been some investment in town ward um, in order, you know, to drive forward uh, similar to the Safer Streets initiative um, with regards to lighting, with regards to um, police presence, etc. So, you know, you'll see a lot more of that coming to you now, Bill, as far as information with regards to the town centre. I know that having sat on bid meetings recently as well, um, the bid are looking at ways they can help to improve the town centre as well. Uh, and things like that, uh, some um, material things just with regards to Merthyr being in bloom and things like that as we come out of or, or as we have this transition out of, of lockdown and out of the pandemic so that we will encourage people to come to the town centre and not feel in safe. Um, obviously in May we're hopeful that the bus station will open and then we'll have a hub there with uh, a presence of PCSOs so we'll have a little bit of added security there uh, with more enhanced CCTV in the town ward as well Bill. Um, with regards to litter, um, gosh I mean as, as everybody will know the amount of um, community litter picking that's done now by volunteers etc, by, by councillors you know has sort of trebled over the last year um, um, and we've still got issues with um, fly tipping, but sort of street litter, if you want to call it that. People have been really um, good and passionate about cleaning up uh, and feeling proud about their own areas. We really shouldn't have to rely on them. I think they're a fabulous asset and they are an asset and they are in, in addition to what we should be doing as well. So we do need to, to pick that up. And I know um, my colleague, Councillor Hughes, is working on that at the moment, Bill. So again, um, whether in this fora or whether in, in um, full council, we will be bringing those updates to you. I don't know if any of my officers uh, want to add anything to that. Thank uh, Lee, you, Chair. Lee, definitely just come in uh, uh, on the back of that, Ashley. So um, what Councillor Smith has raised, uh, obviously we're acutely aware of, um, and uh, uh, you know, obviously we've got the, the fourth priority almost, which is the environment uh, within the plan. Uh, but what uh, myself and Andrew were discussing yesterday is at the next workshop to feature 
the neighbourhood services or the environment um, section so we can start to have a dialogue on some of these issues that have just been touched on now. Um, as I said, we're acutely aware of the challenges as we come out of COVID in terms of the, the, the town environment and some of the, as you said, street lighting issues. Um, the, our population not exactly feeling safe as they're going into the town centre and we need to address all of those because that cuts across everything else really in terms of impact on the economy. So um, what, I, what I would suggest is that we, we'll, we'll have a dialogue in terms of um, featuring um, certain agenda items as part of the ongoing workshop dialogue. Um, but we certainly pick up um, those issues and I know Judith and her team are actually looking at some of those issues that have been raised. Chair, can I come back for a second? Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Do we do we have discussions with ourselves and private landowners in certain areas because they got a part to play? I, you, I can just take the Gurners. Most of um, seventy-five percent of the Gurners is owned by MVH. Do we just have discussions with them about them clean clean certain areas up in the right manner and not wait until somebody phones in and say, hey? You've got to pick that up now. Or, no, or our environmental officers go out and send them a letter. Uh, if I can come back to straight away and answer that. Yeah, so uh, Judith does meet with her counterparts from Earth Valley Homes and that there has been ongoing dialogue with regards to joint working and a joint approach to things like uh, cleansing and grass cutting. Um, obviously, things are probably taking a back seat with regards to the current pandemic issues, but I know there's been regular dialogue um, up until at uh, that point, uh, with regards to uh, our working, yes. But we can again, we can certainly update you on on the latest of that uh, from Judith's point of view. Okay, cheers. Thank you very much. Lisa, did you want to come in? Oh, yeah, sorry, no, sorry. I'm just going to reiterate that, Bill. Um, I think you know we we've got some really good relationships with some of our RSLs, etc. But I think it can be improved. You know, um, only yesterday, I know you will be aware of them, the Gurness Men's Project, a fantastic voluntary um, group, picked up something like, I think I saw on Facebook, something like uh, 30 bags of rubbish, you know, and I know they would work in partnership with some of the RSLs there, and I think perhaps that's just what we need to build on, and I know that Judith, as, as Ellis has alluded to, is having those conversations just to give you some um, reassurance there, Bill. Thank you. Councillor Davis. Uh, yeah, just to follow on with that, I met with... Um, to the directors yesterday from Earth of Valley Zones to discuss the bin issues and Great Relain and some other spots. So um, th we're going to do a an audit with um, with them on the bins and look to uh, replace the ones that are, that are not being used properly and uh, re-establish in, in other areas as well. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Um, I've got a question, and I think it's probably best for Councillor Mitten, but maybe Alice wanted, might want to add something. Um, um, it alludes to something that's with the workshop yesterday and obviously the report. The report talks a lot and the workshop yesterday talked a lot about the, ro the role of scrutiny in, in making this a success and um, the way that the role of scrutiny needs to change in order to adapt to this new plan. Um, I suppose from my perspective, I've, I've had, I, I get very frustrated because we've been talking about changing scrutiny since 2017. Um, I know that we identified back in 2017 that we really needed to overhaul scrutiny to make it more strategic, to make it more valuable, to measure our value. And I know that we've done a lot of work against that in terms of our self-evaluation, self which is really positive. But my question is, um, if we've made, we have made progress, but little progress in my opinion. So for example, we, um, we're still waiting on the Cabinet Forward Work Programme, which is something that's been in the pipeline for years now. So my question is, how are we supposed to change scrutiny in order to adapt to this new plan when we haven't actually addressed the issues that we already had with scrutiny? So are they one and the same or are we going to tackle them individually? What's the plan for changing scrutiny, I suppose? 
Well, the plan, um, Chair, I've already mentioned in my opening um, dialogue with regards to scrutiny, as I said, um, this forthcoming Friday, we've actually got a workshop on it. I do agree with you. It has been um, far too long since we've uh, looked at it. I think, uh, like anything, when you get challenge and support, it makes you sort of open your eyes and address it. And that is what we're actually doing. In relation to the Cabinet Forward Work Plan, I have a workshop with my Cabinet on Thursday. Um, there was a, a work plan and is a work plan in place. Um, there is a forward plan and a work plan. Just want to differentiate from the two. And um, obviously, as we know, you know, scrutiny should be holding cabinet to account and have done so with scrutiny's attendance in governance over the last uh, couple of years as well. So that's that's been there. Um, uh, as I said, you know, my predecessor was working on that as well. Certainly working on that with cabinet. I'm taking that forward. We've got a workshop on Thursday. Um, and we'll we'll have that dashboard available then for for the forward work plan, um, so that we can integrate that then into into governance, good governance as well. I think with regards to scrutiny, it's it's looking at all of our scrutiny. Um, certainly, you know, where we're talking about the RTI and we're talking about the RAD strategy that needs to be looked at in the forward work plan for LASKIP. And I know my colleague uh, Councillor Harvey Jones will certainly take that forward, uh, as will my colleagues with the other scrutinies as well. So. I think it's an opportunity for us to um, reflect, you know, on how scrutiny's looked, what we can bring to scrutiny, how we can move it forward. And I can certainly see that um, being much improved in the future. And literally within weeks, we should be working on that together because it'll be cross party work as well. And we'll work on that together, Chair, and uh, it certainly improve it moving into the future. Thank you, Councillor Mitten. And I know that there's been a work plan and I know there's been attempts at something that would re resemble a cabinet work programme, but there's been sort of a disconnect in terms of in an ideal situation, we would want that cabinet forward work programme to be to be very fundamental part of us determining what our scrutiny work programme looks like and um, making us more effective at holding cabinet to account. And I think, like I said earlier, I totally acknowledge the fact that we've made efforts and there's been work done, some really good work, particularly by the officers. But but I think that there's still a tendency. We do still have that tendency and that habit of, of questioning officers more than we do cabinet. So I would just be interested to hear your thoughts on how we can change that, that um, the way we do scrutiny, specifically holding cabinet, uh, cabinet members to account Better, Lisa. I wonder yeah, what your opinion was on that. No, of course. And, and, and Chair, with all due respect, even though, you know, some of us are long in the tooth and been here for quite a number of years now, I think, you know, my, my adage is we can always learn and we can always continue to learn. So what I would say there is, is there also has to be um, a suite of training as well for our scrutiny members. Um, and, and by that, I'm not dismissing or taking away from anybody, but I think it's supporting them in, you know, the questioning techniques, who to question, what to question, and as you quite rightly said, holding cabinet to account as well. You know, as you far often I will observe a, a scrutiny meeting, and there are always questions to the officers, even though cabinet members are also available. So it's supporting all of our scrutiny members to be able to understand, well, what's the role and responsibility of me as a scrutiny member, as a co-opted member, et cetera, and how can we drive that forward? I think much can be done with regards to pre-scrutiny planning. And as you look at your annual um, forward plans as well, you know, as I said, picking up on what cabinets are looking at and taking that forward. You're quite right about the two being separate because they are separate pieces of work. You know, you have a cabinet work plan, which will be areas that we will drive forward, the RTI, et cetera, governance, scrutiny itself. Um, and then you'll also have um, our um, forward plan. Our forward plan is those key reports um, that will come through quarterly, annually, statutory obligations, et cetera. You know, we know that we would have a, a WAO report at some point annually. So it's actually fitting those in so Cabinet knows when they are coming as well. And then we can match that into um, the scrutiny process as well. OK, thank you, Councillor Mitten. I You're think welcome. that's it on questions. I can't see any other hands up. So if we could move on to comments. Any comments? Yes. Clive? I'm here. Uh, let me just find the page, if you can bear with me. It's on page 
36, um, 3.5. And for me, Chair, this really sums up um, where we are and where we hope to be. And it reads, a key focus of the RTA plan is to ensure that we can economically, efficiently and effectively deliver our strategies, well-being objectives, corporate plan and priorities to provide better outcomes for the residents of Merthyr Tidville. Um, and I think that is the journey that we are on, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Any other comments? I can't see any hands up, um, but just to say, uh, just to say thank you really to um, to everybody involved in the plan, um, and uh, you know, just positive and hopeful for effective change for the future. Really, um, okay. So, in just to take you back to the recommendations, the recommendation was that we uh, the report be noted and debated. I think we've done that successfully. Um, I think there's interference again. I move that, Chair. Okay. Second it, Chair. Okay, thank you. And a vote. Okay. Thank you. I think that's carried. Yeah. Okay, is everybody microphone off? There's a lot of interference again. I'm struggling. Okay. Chair, okay, can so, I just um, thank uh, you for that and give my apologies now. I, I think it would be opportune anyway for us to, to leave the meeting now, but I have another meeting. I'm I, need just to gonna, yeah, I was just going to say, Councillor Mitten, and I'm sure the rest of you don't want to stay now, but thank you all for your time. <laughs> thank you all for your time and uh, I'll see you all soon. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. OK, so moving on, um, we are on agenda item number five, which is um, I'm not sure if anybody still wants the report up on screen. I notice it seems to have disappeared. Um, so it's page 55, item number five, and that's the work programme. Um, so it's just about discussing, really. This is the um, I think, am I right, this is the last meeting of this year, isn't it, from a scrutiny perspective? We need to start thinking about next year. So I just wanted, as you, as I alluded to in the previous agenda item, I will carry, I will pick up with Andrew Mogford on the, you know, how we will fit into the RTI plan going forward. And certainly I would be interested in the Cabinet Forward Work Programme and how that will um, feature in the in the work programme for next year. But I suppose this is a good opportunity to start thinking about what we want um, for that for that next meeting, really. So I have put it over to the committee. Um, thoughts, ideas, anyone? Can I, can I ask, first of all, Chair, that the meeting for the 4th of May the items that we've got there, I think it's three items, are they all going to be presented at that meeting? I'm not sure what you're looking at there, Clive, because my um, my my papers have only got um, the report on service charges in relation to waste bins. Waste the bins? Other, like, the other items you can see, are they, they're sort of items for consideration. Oh, I, I thought that um so the fourth of may doesn't include human resources or the agile working policy no what the way we did it just to remind you clive the way we did it this year was we did the work program and then we a number of items sort of came we had a couple of items that were, were carried forward from last year and we also had a couple of items that came up through the course of the year and what we would do, myself and Maria, is we would put them down at the bottom in a separate table for consideration, knowing that when we discussed the work programme, we could slot them in as and when we wanted to. Yeah. So it just, okay. gave, it just gave members a little bit of a framework in terms of these are the items that we haven't scheduled um, and where would we where would we want them scheduled if 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 need be? So they're items for consideration, certainly for the for, for the next meetings, Clive. 
Right. So the only item I may write in saying for the next meeting are the charge in relation to the waste bins. Is that right? At, at the moment, but but you know, like we've always said, we can change that. I think it just ended up there as a, as a um as a coincidence really you know as we've gone through the year we've switched and changed and moved things around so if we feel that there's something that that requires more urgent attention then of course i'm happy to um substitute that for some of the other other items on there chair can i can i say we will, i won't i like to keep that on because we've had a lot of wheelie bins uh, being pinched on certain areas and people are not purchasing them because they can't afford it off the counter. And then we've got a problem, fry tipping and bits and pieces. So, well, it's certainly an item. It's certainly an item that's close to my heart, Councillor Smith. Yeah. I know uh, that I've had. Um, I know that I've had issues. I think all of us have had issues in our world, one way or another. I, I'm happy to keep it in if everybody's in agreement. The only thing I would say is that we have to make sure that we're not reiterating something that's already gone through neighbourhood services. So from my perspective in this committee, I would be looking at very much the policy side of it. So if you remember when we discussed this at full council and we all raised concerns about it, um, we were assured at the time that each, each, um, each case would be looked at individually. Now in practice, in my experience, that isn't happening. Quite so right. I would be very much looking, I would be wanting to look at it from a very much from a governance and a policy perspective. Yeah, so I agree if, everyone, if everyone's in agreement, I'm happy to keep that in. I don't see there's a problem keeping it there, Jen. OK, then Declan, did you want to come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's just something I've, I've, I've been thinking on this, um, the agenda, because it's going to neighbourhood services scrutiny and also because a couple of other items have gone to neighbourhood services scrutiny. It's something I want to take recommendations from um, the, the, the Committee on Neighbourhood Services. And if we if if we feel strongly about something, I think these should be actually minuted and maybe put in an email um, with all the um, with all the committee uh, included in that email and said the cabinet maybe recommendations for cabinet to, to maybe change things or to look at things uh, in in future where where we where the neighbourhood services committee believes that something hasn't quite worked as it should just as you alluded to there where we were told one thing and 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 an, another thing happened. Yeah, I think from my perspective, Councillor Salmon, and, and I'm sure the more experienced members will set me straight if I'm wrong, but the way I always saw this committee was very much about, you know, if you're discussing something in neighbourhood services and you're getting into the nitty gritty and the detail of what's happening on the streets and you're getting complaints and, and observations being fed through, you scrutinise it from that perspective, but then if that requires further action from a policy change or a policy review or something, then these recommendations back to council or to the exact to the cabinet member, then it should feed up to us. Um, you know that's why each chair is on this committee, so we can start, to, so we can make recommendations on policy change and and that sort of thing. So. You know, I think that's what I would like to see in the future, and it, and particularly where where this RTI is concerned. And I think that Councillor Salmon, that's a really good example of of how we could do that better. Yeah, I agree, Chair, and I, I think that um, it, it may be something that we look at. I, I might suggest maybe a, a task and finish group or something to um, to look at this, but we'll we'll see what comes out of the neighbourhood serves as scrutiny, and then obviously uh, uh, governance scrutiny as well on this subject. Yeah, let's keep it on there for the for me then. Can I make a suggestion? I know that we've got we've got local authority support to the third sector services. That's on the um, area addition, topics for consideration. We've got HR, which I know is close to all of our hearts, and we've got the agile working policy. All three of them are quite important. Um, but I'm also aware of the fact that we need to make sure that we allow space should anything come from this RTI uh, plan? Um, so what are, what are members thinking? Do we want to leave that 
leave that free for the time being or do we want to slot something into May and then anything relating to RTI we'll do later in the year? I think we should, I think we should leave a space here for the RTI because it's very important. A lot of things are happening down the line and perhaps we want a, a quick update on it and you need it because it affects everybody, every, every department. Any other, any other feedback, Clive? Thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't see any problem with that. I mean, we were in the very early stages of this and we had, we've been promised briefings um, every month. Um, so I think we need to keep tabs on that. And, you know, it, it's then, it's up for the officers then to say, well, what progress we've made, if anything, or there's nothing actually to tell us at, at the scrutiny. Yeah. I, can, 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 can I say something? Are we deciding now, we've decided to keep one item on there, and yeah. have we decided to put another item out of any of these three you've got there? The third sector and the others? That's what, that's what the question is, Clive. Oh. Is, the question was, do we want to leave it as it is at the moment with one item with a view to RTI plan coming in as a second item? Or would we like to, at this opportunity, would we like to slot in one of those? From my perspective, Clive, the way I see it is this, we have to, we have to get a grasp and understand and scrutinise this RTI plan before we can look at an agile working policy and before we can start looking at HR again because yeah. it, because it's almost like a chicken and egg and if we get that that sequence the wrong way round we could potentially be do, be doing ourselves a bit of a disservice so what I'd like to do is I'd like to get a bit of a grip on the RTI first and then see how that impacts on HR and agile work working and so on well yes but we, we need to bear in mind that we need to look at HR and yeah. the agile. You know, I, I don't think we should sort of put that aside um, for months in advance because both aspects need to be looked at. But, you know, except if you want to look at the RTI plan, you see how that is um, ticking over, that's fine. So are we looking at the third sector as well to come on in May or not? Well, I think that if we were to bring that one on, Clive, we would potentially have three, three items. And it's so whether as a committee, one of the previous feedbacks have been, um, you know, when I first started, when I first started out as chair, um, I had quite a lot of feedback saying that the, the reports were too heavy. There were too many items. So I'm just mindful. And this this year, I think that we've done quite well in terms of keeping it quite streamlined and keeping it on point. So, so what, I don't so want over I don't want to overload us. So what, what are the three then? Yeah. What are the three Sorry? items? Sorry. What are the three items? Well, if we were to have um, if we have the report on service charges, which is already there. And then we keep a, a gap for RTI plan, potentially. So we that would could potentially be a, an agenda item as well. And then we're suggesting maybe we add in the local authority support to third sector services as well, which would make you three. Okay, chair, just um, to, just just to say something else. The three of us. Do you want our labour group at quarter past six? And we've been on this now since half past three in the pre-meeting. So if we don't agree on something, the three of us will be leaving you very shortly because I need to make myself a cup of tea. Uh, I've been sitting in this chair, as I said, since half past three. OK, Clive, no problem. I tell you what, I'll just make the decision and rather than doing it by uh, by by sort of uh, everybody having their say, Let's leave it as the first, let's leave it as the one item for now. We will leave it open for the RTI to come in if necessary, and then if anything should change in the meantime, then I will um, be I'll, I'll contact the committee members individually, and we can discuss the work plan as a whole at the next meeting. Does that sound okay? Okay. Yeah. 
OK, so if everyone's OK with that, I'll move on because I obviously don't want to lose the majority of the uh, <laughs> committee members. So the other thing was agenda item number six, scrutiny referrals, feedback and follow up actions. There was a follow up for you, Clive, um, from last meeting. Bear with me a second. I'm trying to find it. Uh, there was an action. Um, the infant, there was committee members requested an update in the data captured in relation to free school meals. That action has been completed and there's an action pending. Um, and that was around requesting an overview of the ongoing condition survey assessment in relation to school buildings. I think that was something you raised, Clive, and that's pending at the moment. Uh, my understanding is, is that uh, as soon as that's been received, it'll be circulated. I'm just reading Maria's notes here. Mm -hmm. OK, OK. OK, um, and then the item number seven is reflection and evaluation of meeting. I don't have any sort of reflections. I think we've sort of discussed those as we've gone along. So unless anybody's got anything to say, we can move on. OK. And then number eight is uh, any other business? I haven't got any. So on that note, Clive, you've got 10 whole minutes to get yourself a cup of tea. That's marvellous. Thank, thank you all for your time this evening. And I'll see